Today on Muscle Car, Lou shows you how to make a set of old-fashioned super stock springs perfect for any sleeper project, along with a beefed-up rear end and some creative exhaust suitable for old blue hair's temper. Welcome to the shop. Last week we woke up our sleeper project. This week we're gonna get her on her feet. We're running a GM LS364 crate engine in this original 70 Nova. Last week we put in a gas tank, fuel pump, ran the lines, wired the ignition, and stiffened up the frame to handle the extra horsepower. Then we started her up. Now our LS makes 440 horse, and that's not gonna stand up to the abuse we're gonna put it to. We do, however, have some options. Most guys would just put a nine inch Ford in this thing and go about their business, but that's gonna ruin our sleeper look. I'm gonna use this original GM 10 bolt, except I'm gonna put better gears and better axles in it. I also wanna convert the Nova from monoleaf to multi-leaf. Now this junkyard rear end is exactly like the one that came out of our Nova, except it has correct purchase for multi-leaf. This rear end is commonly referred to as an 8.2 because of the size ring gear that it is. Now, a lot of guys really like the 8.5 because it's a larger ring gear, there's more gear selections and better axle selections. The only downside is they're becoming harder to find, which means they're getting to be more expensive. Here's a tip for you when you're shopping at the junkyard. See how this cover has a ridge? This is an 8.2. An 8.5 is smooth like this one here. The 8.2 is perfect for what we want to do. We're going to use this Eaton Limited Slip Differential. The Posi Performance comes with carbon fiber disc. You can get it for 17 or 28 spline axles. We went with 28 because it's stronger. Our ring and pinion are street gears from Richmond. They make everything from a 308 to a 513 for this rear end. We're using a 411. That'll give us great jump off the line. Now for you younger guys, let me tell you what all those numbers mean. There's probably more stress on the ring and pinion than anything else in the car, because this is where all the engine's power takes a right-hand turn. Our 411 means the pinion gear has to turn just over four times to make the ring gear go around once. Great for fast starts and spinning those tires, but not good for cruising, because the engine's running at a higher RPM. With a higher gear like a 308, the engine's running at a lower RPM, so it's better on gas, but slower off the line. Like love, life, and muscle cars, there's a downside to everything. You've got this higher gear, which has more teeth, so it has more contact area with the ring gear. Unlike this lower gear, which is smaller, and it has less teeth, so it's gonna have less contact area, and it's gonna suffer more abuse. That's why I'm going with this 411. It's a good compromise, and if it breaks, it was worth it. Rebuilding a rear end is not that difficult. However, there's a lot of specs for torques and clearances you need to pay attention to. Your ring set will include all that information. If you screw this up, the cloud behind your car won't be from your tires. Before I go any further, I gotta make some room for some new parts. I like to spray my brakes down before I tear it apart. It keeps the dust down. A few weeks ago you saw me do a disc brake conversion on the front of this thing. Being at the front does the bulk of the stopping, I decided to go with stock drums in the back. I've seen this mistake before. Primary shoe, secondary shoe. You always want to have your primary shoe going towards the front of the vehicle. Now you know. Alright, I needed some axles that weren't going to break. So I called Summit and they sent me a pair of these superior axles, the Evolution series, and they're made of high quality steel. Check it out. The splines are rolled and pressed during the forging process, making them 35% stronger than stock. So they're tough. Now cut axle splines are machined after the steel cools. So they won't be as strong as what I've got right here. We changed our 8.2 from a 308 to a 411 with a posi and put some seriously tough axles in it. When we get back from the break, we're going to give Granny's sneakers some serious traction. Hey! 
Welcome back. We updated our rear rim with new gears, posi unit, axles, and drum brakes. Now it's time to address the suspension. This monoleaf is old and outdated, and it's not going to work for the abuse we're going to put it through, so it's added air. We have a few different ways we can fix this. We can mini tub it, we can put a three link in it, or a four link, or even ladder bar it. But those mods are really hard to hide, and I don't want to cut up old blue hair that much. Back in the day, the big yellow traction bars were the norm. They were great for keeping the axle where it was supposed to be. When you're nailing it, the rear end wants to twist upwards, and Mopar racers back in the 60s had the most problems with that. So they came up with a solution, the super stock spring. When power is transferred to the rear end, the pinion tries to rotate upwards, putting more stress on the front of the springs. Our stock monoleaf was not designed to handle this kind of abuse. So the tire spins. Not what we want. On the other hand, super stock springs have more leafs up front, which means more tension. This forces the tires back to the ground so they can hook up. This is a stock replacement spring for a second generation Nova, but it's going to need a slight modification. Remember those super stock springs I told you about? I'm going to show you how to make a pair. Be careful when you're taking these packs apart. They need to be clamped so they won't fly apart when you're pulling off the hardware. I'm going to cut this center pin here, but I'm going to leave these two C-clamps in place just for safety. Remember, we're not cutting on the front, only on the rear of the leaves, so I'll mark them to avoid any screw-ups. I'm basically creating a short stagger. This Nova only needs a two-inch cut, That'll take out all the resistance from the rear of the leaves. If you don't have a cold saw for this, a chop saw or a cutoff wheel will do the trick. Now I've got a slight problem. I got a pretty big gap from end to end. I can fix that. What you can do is go wander around the junkyard or you can find a leaf spring around your shop and use it. Again, a two inch stagger is all I want. Once they're cut, I'll round them off with a grinder and create a bevel to help them slide better. It's about time to slam these babies back together, but I've encountered a slight problem. My new center pin is larger than my old one, but that's okay. Now you can bore these out if you take your time with a good drill, but I ain't got time. Fire! <laughs> Fire! We're finally ready to put these together, starting with the slider pads. Then compress the leaves with C-clamps and put in the center pins. These factory style clamps will allow the leaves to slide, but it won't allow them to come apart. It's not required, but I'm tacking them anyway, because we plan to push these babies to the limit. And that's how you make your own super stock springs. Less tension in the rear, more up front. You Mopar guys, you can go out and buy some. You Ford and Chevy guys, you gotta make your own. But now, you know how. With new bushings in the rear, and also on the springs, they can be installed with the original hardware. I've got one more thing to help these super stock springs do their job. This little pinion snubber is adjustable, and it helps limit the rotation of the rear end, so it gets all the power it needs to go, the ground. Once I have the rear end in position, I can connect the back of my springs with new shackles, then introduce our beefed up 8.2 to its new companion, and we'll keep it all together with new U-bolts and brackets from Classic Industries. This is what we started out with. This is what we got. Who says size doesn't matter? Now the last piece of this puzzle are these competition engineering three-way adjustable drag shocks. Now I've encountered a slight problem being that I'm running a bigger tire. My stock shock location was on the outside of the leaf spring. I'm changing that, moving it to the inside, and that'll give me the clearance that I need. Using eighth inch steel, I'll mount these brackets against the frame. They'll help distribute all that force we're going to put on it. I'm tacking in steel tubing as a cross member to mount the shocks to. Then after figuring out where they need to be connected, I'll weld in a bolt. Well, 
it may seem like a lot of work to run bigger tires, but it's all worth it, I assure you. Later on in the show, I'm going to show you how to convert your exhaust system to go in and out of stealth mode. In 1969, aerodynamics was coming of age in NASCAR. Mercury responded with the Cyclone Spoiler 2, a winner at the track and on the street. This week's profile is the rare Mercury Cyclone. It was built for the high banks of NASCAR, but this one had a really strange life. This week's muscle car flashback, the 69 Mercury Cyclone Spoiler 2. NASCAR racers were running some strange looking machinery back in 69. The Plymouth Superbird and the Ford Torino Talladega were the cars to beat on the big track. Mercury Cyclone Spoiler needed some help. The Cyclone Spoiler 2 took care of that. An aerodynamic fastback built low, long, and dangerous. Neil Yarbrough gets the checkered flag. But Ford had to make 500 of these babies for the street before the Spoiler 2 could take the track. They named him after two of Ford's NASCAR drivers. Red for Cale Yarbrough, blue for Dan Gurney. Even though Gurney never drove one in a race. Dick Fleener's Spoiler 2 is one of about 90 that are still running. There's the Spoiler 2 and the Spoiler, and this is the one they built especially for NASCAR, very limited production, special body mods. The Spoiler 2 was all about the body. It had to be low, it had to be aero, and it had to be done yesterday so they could get this thing on the track. A 19-inch extension on the nose bent down for better airflow at high speed and welded in a hurry. Man, you can still see the scene. Front grille from Ford's NASCAR Torino with a rubber gasket all around so the air would flow just a tiny bit better. A Torino rear bumper sat up front on the spoiler, chopped up into three pieces and welded up to fit. And out back, a full width spoiler made from the finest of plastic, totally useless till you're doing at least 100. Turn signals out of a Ford van. You don't need them on a race car. They just stuck in whatever was handy. The Spoiler 2's even had the rocker panels rolled under a little further, just so the car could sit a tiny bit closer to the ground. They then had to reshape the fender so it would match the rocker panel. When they got to the track, the car was an inch lower and a lot faster. The NASCAR Spoilers had 427 big blocks, and Mercury made some for the street with 428s. But all you could get in the Spoiler 2 was a column shift automatic and a 351 Windsor small block. A four barrel and 290 horses made it the strongest 351 that Ford ever put out. 3,400 pounds and a 325 gear in the rear end made the spoiler a lot better on the top end than on the bottom. But it rolls like a freight train once you get that thing going. Speed didn't matter to one guy who owned this spoiler back in the 70s. He was more interested in taking it slow. Whoa, this is just wrong, but it gets worse. If you want to pull lawnmowers, get a truck. It's got a good home now. Spoiler 2s aren't that expensive, considering how rare they are. A clean one in good shape, it'll bring about 75 grand. And that just might be a bargain for guys who appreciate NASCAR muscle and a piece of racing history. I'd like to get one of those little trailers to pull behind old blue hair. I think it'd be pretty cool. Stick around, we'll be right back. Welcome back. I've only got a few minutes left to finish up this exhaust. Now I really want to scare the hell out of my competition before I blow their doors off. So I put in these Y pipes for some old school cutouts, but I'm gonna teach an old dog new tricks. Now back in the day, you would have to manually undo the pipe covers. That would allow the exhaust to come straight out of the headers. But I've got an even better way. And here it is. I got these electric cutouts from DMH Performance. The flip of a switch, this butterfly opens up, and you've got open exhaust. Now they're made out of aircraft grade aluminum, and you can get them anywhere between two and four inch diameter. What's cool about these is you can put them on your existing exhaust with little or no modifications. Now check this out. This switch will get mounted underneath the dash. Be afraid. Be very afraid. 
<laughs> Since we're hiding these underneath, I'm making some short turndowns to avoid cooking the floor. No, I'm not huffing fumes. I'm using this aluminum tubing to mimic my three inch drive shaft that I've got on order. Cause I'm using two and a half inch exhaust. I've got to make sure that I've got enough clearance to put it all in. And this is doable. Now I'm gonna finish these off with some cherry bombs. Now you older guys will remember that classic round tubular glass pack. Well, they're still available, but times have changed. They also came out with an entire line of performance mufflers for every application. These are the new Vortex series. Since the exhaust goes through the middle, these Vortex series mufflers are reversible. That means they can be installed any way you want. I'm taking extra care to keep these pipes close to the body because we don't want anybody to see the bigger exhaust. I got one more thing to fool that unsuspecting victim, a little bit of street camouflage. We did a lot of stuff this week, but this is by far the coolest. Next week we're gonna button this baby up and then we're gonna see what trouble we can get into. Later! <laughs>